All right. So, you're looking to get into Mortal Shell's new Virtuous Cycle DLC, but you don't know exactly how. I'm here to give a brief overview of the game mode, talk about how to get started, talk about things that will help you a lot, really good perks, really good weapons, things that are going to allow you to even cheese bosses, how to heal while doing runs, because there are no healing items normally. All sorts of information that will help you as a beginner get to where I'm at in terms of progression. So, to begin, my first piece of advice is that you complete the main game's campaign before attempting the DLC. You at least want to have an understanding of the combat mechanics, the enemies, item locations, the maps, and especially bosses uh, before attempting this. You don't have to, and even if you have played it but you're rusty, you can de-rust in this mode, but you must understand that this mode is a bit unforgiving at first, and you can't let it discourage you. Don't lose hope. At its core, the Virtuous DLC is a roguelite DLC, which means it has roguelike game mechanics. And a roguelike is, well, when you die, you lose everything, essentially is the easy description. So when you die in a run in the Virtuous cycle, um, you're going to lose all of the perks, all of your money, everything. And it's, it's going to feel a bit rough at first. But there are ways to begin to make slow progression towards permanent upgrades. And I'm going to show you how to maximize getting those as quickly as possible and getting yourself to a point where you can start completing runs as quickly as possible. So to begin, we need to understand what perks are in this uh, game mode. Uh, where they're called instincts. Okay? Instincts are things that you can get from towers in-game, which we're about to talk about. And they exist in multiple different categories. You can look at the instinct screen in-game, and you will see that there is a newly added skill tree-like system. <clears throat> and that there are multiple types of instincts on this screen. We have parry instincts, riposte, harden, dodge, character, last roll and last chance, stone, stomp, and kick. So your falling attack, your plunging attack, and your kick. Weapon instincts and combat instincts. We also have a couple instincts for the Ballista Zooka, the ranged weapon in your arsenal. These circles represent the amount of perks that you can have in each category. So you can have two dodge instincts active at once, two character instincts, etc. Um, the circles on the outside lane on the top are for progression, and the other ones on the bottom are for mortal instincts. We will go into these in time, but right now it's not important. So let's go ahead and jump in game and take a look at a tower and learn more about instincts. This here is a tower. Towers are what give you instincts. So for this one here, it's yellow. They come in three colors. White towers are free. You can walk up to them, take a perk, nothing needed. Red towers require you to defeat enemies that are around them before you're allowed to open the tower. There is in fact a red tower in the distance over there. Yellow towers, like this one, require you to offer tar in order to purchase them and open them. Right now we have the tar, so we're going to open it and take a look. So how the instinct system works is each tower that you find is going to be randomly generated to pull from a certain pool that I showed you on the earlier skill screen. So, for example, uh, this is clearly a pool of Harden abilities, like we saw on the skill tree. These, all three of them, are Harden related. Ignore the bonus instinct for now. So it will randomly pull three instincts that exist in the game. These are not the only three for Harden, but these are three. And you'll be able to pick one. So this is the basic premise of getting more powerful throughout the DLC. You find these towers, and you pick perks. These ones, all being harden related, 
Uh, I think out of these three, the best one is hardened cooldown. So I'm going to take that one. But first, let's talk about the bonus instinct, which is damage plus one. It's called a mortal uh, instinct, as you can tell by the red color and the mortal title in the upper right. So mortal instincts are basically just stat increases. They give you general damage resistances and things like that. So you can find ones that increase your resistance to fire, ones that increase, increase excuse me, your resistance to ice, poison, falling. They can increase your base damage, etc. They are very, very helpful, but they're not generally stronger by themselves. Uh, than picking regular perks. Sometimes you will be able to pick Mortal Instincts as one of the three that you roll in a tower. And other times, you will roll towers that have all three Mortal Instincts. Um, but a lot of the time, Mortal Instincts are going to be bonuses. Um, not every tower will have a bonus instinct like this one, a fourth slot. But if you get lucky, you can get towers like this that have four. Instincts come in multiple rarities, which we're going to go into further later, but gray ones like this are the base rarity, and therefore are the least helpful. As you can see, these uh, percentages are only 10%. However, there is also green, which is uncommon, and that would raise the percentages here to, let's say, 15%. And then we would have blue, which is rare, and then purple, which is epic, and then orange, which is legendary. We'll get into more about those and how to get them later. But there are multiple rarities, and they improve the quality of whatever it is the perk does. So a legendary Harden cooldown would obviously re uh, reduce the cooldown of our Harden ability much, much more than a common gray one. Mortal Instincts do not have rarities. They are just red, they are Mortal Instincts, that's it. However, all Instincts can also be upgraded. As in, if you find the same instinct again in another tower, and it gives you the choice to pick it again, you can upgrade it from level 1, 2, 3, 4, and you will slowly increase the power of its ability. So like, again, if we're using hard down, harden, excuse me, cooldown as our example, you could find an upgrade that would raise it by 2%. So it'd be 12 instead of 10, and then the next one might be 14 and slowly it could raise in power and even in rarity if you find it enough times, but obviously it would be a lot faster to just hopefully find it in a higher rarity. But enough about that. Basically, you're going to find these towers, and you're going to pick perks from them. Like so. This will make you more powerful as you play through the DLC. So... Now that we have a basic understanding of what instincts are, because we're going to be talking about them a lot later down the line, what is the objective for the DLC? What am I doing this for? You're looking to complete the three temples from the main campaign. The temples are the dungeons that have bosses at the end, and then you fought the bosses, and you get sacred glands from them. Your objective in the DLC is to beat all of these temples in a row, and all of the bosses, um without dying, with very limited healing. These towers are one of the ways you can heal. You may have noticed that I gained HP, a very small amount, from grabbing a new perk. Whenever you get a perk in this game, or in this DLC, you will heal a little bit of life, and you can improve that amount of life that you'll get back through a mortal instinct. And we'll talk more about that later. So... Yes, our objective is to get into these temples. How do we get into them? Do we just go to where they are on the map? Kind of. Each door to the temple is locked, and there are two ways to enter the temple. The first is to search these pillars, and one of the pillars will contain the choice of one of three tokens. They are yellow. These tokens will be named after each, three temp each of the three temples and will allow you to enter the temple. You can, in fact, teleport to the temple, like a fast travel, once you find it. Um, and this will end your time in Fulgrim and allow you to start running through the temples. We're going to go into that a little bit, in a little bit. But for now, all you need to know is that's the first way to get into temples. The second is you can pay, if you directly go to it on the map, you can pay 
5,000 tar to enter without needing to find the token. But tar is hard to come by, and that's something that you probably won't do for a while, if at all. So, now that we understand instincts and we understand the objective of the DLC, let's get into the actual important part. Where do I start? How do I actually get started? Let's begin. So now that we understand the objective of the DLC, we understand instincts and how to get them, where do we begin? Well, collecting supplies and killing enemies. The simple answer is just to play. But allow me to explain. Why we need supplies, particularly what we need being the more important question, is we need different items that give us tar, consumable tar, and glimpses, consumable or otherwise. Why we need these two things is we have access to something called the Runic Gate whenever we're in the hub world. And the Runic Gate allows us to purchase upgrades that are permanent to our character. Where you start is collecting supplies for this gate. And there's other things we'll be doing at the same time, but allow me to explain more about the gate first. So, the thing you want to be doing with the gate, particularly, I know there's a lot happening on screen right now, don't even worry about this first page right now. The second page is where things are important. In order to make your life easier, the first thing you want to do is get enough tar and glimpses to start working on. First, white pillars. This bonus can only go up to three. So right now it's at plus zero, it can go to plus three. This adds white pillars that are just free to run up, touch, and get perks from to your game world. This makes things a lot easier because each and every area of the game can have up to three additional white pillars, excuse me. And it's not too expensive. Uh, 25 glimpses might seem like a lot at first if you're just starting off and you're having trouble getting them, but we'll go over things you can do to start getting glimpses very quickly. The second thing is resolve power. You can start every run with up to three bars. So again, it starts at zero, goes up to three. Starting with resolve is obviously very good. You can use it for parrying, you can use it for your weapon supers, and I highly advise that you use parrying and weapon supers a lot in this DLC because these can help you clear out enemies and heal yourself. Next, retain tar. This is probably the most important, but also takes much longer than these two. So it's good to get these two out of the way first, because they can only go to three. Retain tar can go all the way to 100. It goes 1% at a time, two glim glimpses per percent, and the amount will never go up. It'll never take more. You can get the amount of tar that you retain all the way to 100, so that if you die, you keep all of the tar that you had on your body from killing enemies. I cannot stress enough that it helps a lot with your farming to be able to keep all of this tar that you had before losing a run. So these are the three that you want to focus on for glimpses. Well, what about the ones that cost tar? The very first and most important is actually last chance. So. In this game, there is a perk called Endless Unborn. It is an instinct, and you get it as a bonus instinct. As in, if you touch a tower, it comes as that fourth slot that's just a bonus. You don't have to pick it, you just get it. What Endless Unborn is, is it gives you back your revive if you die. So in Mortal Shell, you should be aware that if you lose all your HP, your foundling will come shooting out of your shell, and uh, they have one hit of health, but you can run back up to your shell one time and get back inside of it, and it will restore your health to full. So basically, you have two lives at any given time. In the Virtuous Cycle, you can restore this resurrection if you've lost it by finding the Endless Unborn Instinct within a pillar. So, this improved last chance increases your odds of finding that endless unborn. It goes from 0% to 
to 30%. 30% may not sound good, but it is really good actually. Because of the amount of towers you'll be finding, it is very likely that within a zone, you'll be able to find your resurrection ability again uh, if you've lost it. This will increase the amount of time that your runs can go and your survivability immensely. So you should definitely focus on white pillars, resolve power, retain tar, and improve last chance as your abilities first. Once you get done improve last chance, the rest of your tar can be used to upgrade the chances of you getting better starting instincts. So how this works, uh, or you could also use glimpses for tier increase, but we're not going to worry about that until I explain this. How this works is whenever you find an instinct to start, you can make sure that its rarity starts at a higher tier. So we found a hardened cooldown earlier, right? And it was gray. If we had had a higher chance of uncommon, that instinct would have started perhaps at green. This is how these work. You want to focus on these to increase your chances of the perks that you find for the first time being better. Um, you might think that it could be a detriment to upgrade Uncommon first instead of Epic, but Epic only goes up a certain am amount. I believe the chance of Epic can only go to 10% or 20%, I forget now, uh, whereas these ones can go much higher. I think this is 10, this is 20, and this is 30. Um, so no matter what, having all three of these slowly be upgraded will just help your odds at finding better perks. But I wouldn't worry too much about that right now. Tier increase is whenever you find an instinct again. Remember how I talked about you can upgrade them? There is a chance that it could just jump up a rarity. So you have a chance that a gray instinct you have could just become an uncommon. They can't go straight to legendary. There's a separate ability for that but again all of this you don't really need to worry about until you get going i'm just explaining that is what you'd kind of want to prioritize spending your money on you can also save up your money to buy these incredibly expensive loots which i will talk more about later now with all that word garble out of the way you're like okay i understand i'm going to purchase the second page items first with the, the supplies that I'm getting, but how do I actually begin? How do I get these supplies? Where do I start? So back to the original question about me, me saying just play. How you want to go about it is picking Haros the Vassal and then a weapon of your choice that you like. So... That's how I would recommend beginning. If you would like to metagame a little bit, if you'd like to use a weapon that's good and that will help you win in the long run, the best weapons, in my opinion, are the hammer and chisel, which I think is overall the best for this game mode. I'll explain why later. It has to do with a weapon instinct that it has. The hallowed sword and the locked weapon on the right, the axatana, the new one. The Axatana is actually kind of broken as far as doing damage goes. Um, the reason why is these weapons all have very good weapon perks. They all do good damage. They're all fast. They don't hinder your movement speed. Whereas, unfortunately, the Smoldering Mace and Martyr's Blade make you roll slower. Um, they have very, very slow attack speed, and even though they hit very hard, there is a good chance that you could be hit while trying to swing them. Uh, and in this mode, health is everything. It is kind of risky. You can still win with these weapons. In fact, I have. Um, but your success rate might be lower, unless you're very dedicated to learning how to do everything with the weapon without making many mistakes. I know the pain. The Martyr's Blade is actually my favorite weapon, as I am a great sword boy. I like big swords. But overall, you're going to see the most success with the Hammer and Chisel, the Axatana, or the Hallowed Sword. Probably in that order if I had to rate them. Um, but why, why are you saying pick Heros? Why are we talking about picking a weapon, right? Let's, let's go over that. 
There's another section in your inventory beside instincts called runic familiarity. And these are essentially challenges that you can complete that will again award you with permanent unlocks for the mode. In order to unlock Hadern, the new shell, and the Axatana, you simply have to find one pillar with each of the shells slash weapons. So you know how we just entered a run, we found a pillar, we got an instinct. If you want to unlock Hadern and the Axatana right away, all you need to do is start a run, pick one of the four shells. So, like Haros, the foundling doesn't isn't needed for this. You just need these four. Pick a shell, pick a weapon, run into the, the game world, find the nearest pillar that you can access, grab an instinct, let yourself die, come back to the hub, do it again three more times. That's all you have to do. You can get it done in less than five minutes. If all you want is to unlock the new character and the weapon, right? But what else is important about this menu? You can get skins for all the characters. Skins did exist in the main campaign as unlockables. However, they didn't really do anything for you. All they do is make you look cooler, right? Gives you some variety in your color palette. However, skins in the Virtuous Cycle actually have stat effects. So, for example, I've unlocked the Haros Sun Vassal skin. And that is the first thing that I recommend you work on. That's why I said play Haros first, even if you don't like his shell that much. Because you need to kill 60 brigands. Normally, to unlock the, the Sun Vassal shade, it will say kill 60 brigands. Brigands are the little thief people that are all around Falgrim, the dudes with bags over their heads with clubs and crossbows, just the basic enemy. There are tons of them around the game world. And what you want to do is kill 60 of them. It sounds like a lot, but you can do this in 10 to 20 minutes max. Um, it doesn't matter if you die, if you lose a run, it does not matter. You just have to keep doing runs as Haros to kill 60 and unlock the Sun Vassal Shade. And I'll explain why in a second, but I also want to explain why I said to use one weapon. As you can see on the right side of the screen, the fourth one down, I've already kind of started to upgrade it. The Hollowed Sword uh, perk here, the familiarity. What is that? So, killing a certain number of enemies, it starts at 50, as you can see with the ones below that, and it will go up each time for each rarity uh, as you go. You start at common. Killing 50 enemies means uh, that with that weapon, so let's say the Hallowed Sword, you'll start with a weapon instinct uh, for free, and it will be common rarity. Then after that, you can kill more enemies to make it uncommon rarity to start. So each time you start a run with the weapon that you've been killing things with, you will start with a instinct that helps your weapon right out the gate, and you can level it up all the way to epic to get a purple rarity to start. And these are very helpful. They are random, but there are certain ones that I have noticed that you cannot start with. I will go into that a little bit down the line. But for now, that's why I said play Heroes first. That's why I said pick a weapon that you like, or if you want to meta, you can pick one of the good ones I mentioned, and then just kill things with that weapon until you get it to starting rarity purple, to epic, so that you can start runs with that weapon's good perks. Now, what about the, the Sun Vassal skin? What is so good about this? The Sun Vassal skin allows you to start with plus 20 to tar drop. That means everything you kill is going to give you more tar. But more importantly, it gives you 10,000 tar to your bank, which is lost upon dying. Now you might think, that doesn't sound very useful. I'm already having to, you know, take back consumable tar to spend at the runic gate. How does this help me? Well, while... I should also mention that this is lost upon dying even if you max out the ability to retain tar upon death. 
the skin gives you 10k and you just can't keep it unless you beat the run. If you beat the run, you actually keep it. Um, but why does it matter if it's only temporary, you might be asking. We're going to go into it. I'm going to show you how to do it. If you can get to a point where you can beat the first temple, and it's the easiest temple, it's the Shrine of Ash. The Shrine of Ash is incredibly easy. It's filled with items to pick up. And Imrod, the boss, is the easiest boss in the game. Besides maybe Grisha, who's technically a mini-boss. Um, I'm can. i going to show you some footage of how to do it, to do a quick run of it. But if you can beat any boss, you gain access to the Runic Gate after the boss fight. And it allows you to spend your tar and glimpses mid run that means if you can consistently make it to the shrine of ash for a run you can spend all 10k of that money every time on upgrades in the runic gate that cost tar this is incredibly useful early game to get yourself going and I can show you how to make it to the Shrine of Ash one of two ways. One will let you spend more tar, and the other won't. And I can show you how to just run past most things and figure out how to get it done as quickly as possible. But that is how you want to start playing the game. You're going to go into here, start as Harrows, pick a weapon, begin cycle. And then once you load into the game world, you're going to run around and kill brigands. Wherever they are in, in Falgrim, we started near the cemetery. You're just going to run around and kill brigands and pick up items as well. That's something that I cannot stress enough. All of the items from the main campaign will be on the ground sitting around Falgrim. And you can pick them up and you keep those consumable items like we talked about glimpses. And tar are the most important ones. Keep these in your inventory. And then when you lose a run and you go back to the runic gate, you can spend these on all those upgrades I mentioned. And that's going to get you more and more powerful in order to complete runs. All you got to do is run around and kill things and check camps and things like that. Like if you see a camp, it probably has items in it like this. And sometimes they can be instincts. That's a different upgrade that is in the... Um, the tree, the runic gate that you can buy. Don't worry about that. Most of the time for you, it's going to be items like this. And all you have to do is collect these, basically. Just get yourself a collection. Also, consumables are fine, too. We're going to talk more about consumables in a bit. But that's how you get started. It doesn't sound like anything fancy. It doesn't sound, you know, amazing. Uh, or it might not sound very fun. But the easiest way to beat the DLC to start is just to run around the map, memorize spawn locations for towers. Because while they are random, you know, you can start to build up a memory of where they can and can't spawn. So you can be like, oh, sometimes a tower spawns here. And you can go and check if it did. And if it did, great. If it didn't, oh, well, I'll check someplace else. You can memorize item locations, so you can pick them up every run to try to get good items. And you can memorize where certain groups of enemies would be. And while the enemies are random, again, it's helpful to know these things. And you will just get this information the more you do runs, the more you play the game. So again, not the most you know, illustrious piece of advice to begin, but all you need to do to start is play. Use Haros, use a weapon, gain those runic familiarities. So, now that we have that, I'm going to show you one quick way to get some extra glimpses to start. Because glimpses are a little bit easier than tar. And then we'll talk about how to get to your first temple and how to complete that temple. So... In the Virtuous Cycle, there are a number of mini-bosses that are strewn about the game world, and they're actually referenced in the Runic Familiarity page, because they are some of the ways you can unlock skins. So if we look below 
the maxed out Sun Vassal shade, you can see unlock Harrow's Burden Keeper shade. And it's kill Vim five times with Harrow's. Vim is a mini boss uh, within the first temple, the Shrine of Ash. We'll get to that later, but there are all kinds of mini bosses. You have Vim, you have the Grisha, you have Noctavaga, I believe is his name, uh, the mini boss version of the vampire guys that run around, these guys. Um, and these mini bosses, you also have Baghead. If you remember Baghead from the main campaign, Baghead is actually a fightable boss. I can show you locations for all of them if people need, but they are where they are from the main campaign. They haven't moved. And these mini bosses, if you defeat them, give you a unique instinct whenever you beat them. So I'm going to kill Grisha real fast, and then we'll see what he gives us. Okay, so now that he's dead, we can pick up this unknown item he drops, and it gives us an instinct. Now, first of all, it just gives you random instincts, like you can just pick as if you um, grab the tower. So these are random. But the one you'll get every time is the bonus instinct, in this case, Grisha Hunter. And as you can see, it just gives you 20 glimpses. Basically, every mini boss is going to have this instinct, and it gives you, I believe some of them can give you 15, some of them can give you 25. They're all somewhere around 20. So if you hunt these mini bosses per run, and you know how to kill them, right, consistently without too much hassle, um, and I'll show you, again, some cheese strats using certain weapons, uh, you can easily just farm these guys for easy glimpses. I'd still say it's easier to just make runs through the game world and get lots of the consumable ones because you can get some that give you a ton, like Disdain. Um, I still think that's easier, but it is worth noting that killing these mini-bosses not only gives you regular instincts, but it also gives you a ton of glimpses. And, of course, sometimes they guard items like this chest, which can be used to get yourself even more consumables and even more glimpses or tar. So, this is something to keep in mind when hunting around Fulgrim. Now let's move on to uh, talking about healing and temples. So now let's discuss different ways that you can heal to help you survive your runs in order to not only get to your first temple, but complete your first temple, so that we can start getting more upgrades. So, there's a couple different ways. The first and the easiest is simply, well, not easiest, but I should say most accessible to you, is your parry. You'll start every run, if you've been listening to my advice, with multiple bars of resolve, and you can use these for parries as one of the things that you do. You start the game with the healing parry, which will give you back a decently sizable chunk of health whenever you parry an enemy. In general, parries in Mortal Shell are very good, as they stun enemies or bosses uh, when you do them. They do quite a considerable amount of damage, and they heal you in the case of the healing parry, or do other things. The issue is, if you're someone like me, it's not that I'm bad at the parries in Mortal Shell, but I definitely haven't mastered them, I don't feel, like some people in the community. So if you're anything like me, you might not want to risk a parry against a certain boss, perhaps, uh, that where if you get hit by them, you lose a sizable chunk of your health that now you're going to have a hard time getting back. Um, and if you're very low on health and you really need the health, a parry can save you, but it can also get you killed. So there are other ways to get your health back besides parries, but the most accessible is definitely parrying. So it would help you and it would benefit you to get good at your parry timing uh, and learn how parries work. The second way is through consumables. So there is a consumable that you have in the game that can heal you. It's actually the Mortal Token. Mortal Tokens 
absorb the damage of an attack that you take when hardened um, and give that value of health back. So what you want to do is find an opening to use the token, harden when a boss or an enemy you're fighting does an attack that's going to do a lot of damage, and then let that attack hit your harden, and it will heal you a sizable chunk of your HP. This is incredibly useful, but the problem is this is a consumable item that is randomly found. There is no way to guarantee you'll get these. There is no way to buy these. So over the course of me playing, I built up quite a sizable collection of 20 or 30 of these, which is great to have during any particular run. Um, but at the same time, this isn't the best way to... You can't rely on these. These are helpful if you're going to win a run. And you're like, I know I've got this if I just had a little bit more health. You're in the middle of a boss fight. You find an opening. You use it. I would definitely recommend keeping them on your quick bar. And using them if you think that you need them to save a run. But I would not rely on them the entire run or while going through zones. Because you will run out. And it's very, you have to farm to get more. It's very hard. Um, so that is another way. These are very useful, but use them wisely. So there's also, of course, instincts. There are some instincts in the game that can actually heal you. Um, I'm going to try to get some footage of at least two of them, but these are random, and I want to get this video up uh, as quickly as possible. That's not, that's why I'm not editing it super well. I'm just trying to get this out here for people to help. Um, there is a character instinct, and there are weapon instincts that can heal you. Let's talk a bit about those. Uh, you can also find parry instincts for your heal parry that make you heal more. So that can increase the power of your heals. The character instinct you'd be looking for is called regeneration. So I can use this skin here to give you an example of this ability. Uh, under the character instinct tree, I'm using corrupted Aerodrim's skin. So he starts with this, but you can find this in Pillars. And I know that this is legendary, but this perk can still be useful at lower rarities. So, regeneration is a perk that slowly refills your health until a certain maximum threshold. The most it can go at legendary is 75%, which is very, very, very strong. This perk is definitely very... I don't want to say useless, uh, but you're not going to enjoy the amount of health that it refills at low ranks. So what I mean by that is common regeneration, like a gray version of this perk, is not very good. Uh, it only restores your health up to like 10% or something, 10 or 15. It's very low. But at blue and purple, this perk is okay. So obviously you will have to start getting far enough in the game where you're getting more blues and purple uh, rarity instincts, right? But that goes the same for most of the instincts I'm going to talk about to you here. They're very good if you can get them at blue to start. Blue is not great, but it can help you start to finish temples. Purple can help you finish runs. Legendary can help you finish runs very easily. Um, so that's going to go the same for everything I show you here. You're just going to have to keep playing. Keep getting those upgrades. Eventually, you will get to a point where you can get these more consistently. It is always a little bit based on RNG. But regeneration is pretty good, starting from blue. It does regenerate your health very, very slowly, I should point out. Uh, in fact, I can show you here. I'll let him hit me around. Iridrim has a ton of HP, so it starts healing for him at an earlier point. As you can see, if you pay attention to my life bar, it very, very slowly will increase. Actually, I think that might be 75%. Let me, sorry, get him lower. Now I'm really low, so now you can definitely see it. So yeah. It is a slow tick. And you might think, wow, that's not very helpful. But in the long scheme of things, 
this perk will save you if you're patient. I don't want to say you should have to play every run super carefully, but if you're looking to just win, if you're looking to cheese by any means necessary, you can play a boss fight super cautious and only attack using hardened attacks so they can't hit you back. And if you're wounded on health, that is, let your health slowly build back up, right? And then when it hits its threshold, you can go back in a little bit. This is a very boring way to play, uh, I'll tell you firsthand. But if you're just looking to win, regeneration can help. But it's the weakest of all of the instincts I'm about to mention. Because the regeneration is very slow. And at lower rarities, it doesn't raise your health as much. If you can get it to epic, epic restores up to 50% of your HP. So that, and it's very acquirable that way. But overall... It is also worth noting that this instinct is one of the rarer ones. Character instincts, this line, don't show up a ton in towers, so you might not even get this in a run. So that's why I made this the first one to talk about, because it's the least impressive, but it is there. Another perk that you can use to restore HP are some of the weapons perks. So I'm going to go get those real fast, see if I can find some footage of them. And then we'll talk about those. The next weapon instinct that can heal you and give you some HP back um, is going to be for the hammer and chisel. Leeching chisel. Leeching chisel returns a percentage amount of the damage you deal with chisel attacks uh, to your health. So up to a certain amount, that way they put that restriction on there. That way if you upgrade your damage super, super high, there is a limit on how much total health you can heal with the chisel. Still, this is probably, in my opinion, the easiest way to beat this DLC. If you manage to get this ability, you can probably beat it by simply cheesing. It is very easy. Um, this, I think, might make the hammer and chisel the best weapon for this DLC. This is why I said that, even over the Axatana. Because while I think the Axatana is more broken damage-wise, and it has some other things we'll talk about near the end, this ability on its own, when the hammer and chisel was already one of the better weapons in the game, makes this weapon godly. So how it works is any attack that uses the chisel heals you, right? So your R1 swipes with the chisel once. This doesn't give you a lot of HP back because this is not only a light attack, but it also uh, is, you know, it also does the least damage in general. So it only does seven damage with the chisel. Um, so this isn't going to heal you for very much, right? But it is there. Every R1 you do is going to... It's actually a good thing he hit me here. As you can see on my health bar down there. A little tiny chunk. Obviously, the higher your rarity, the better the skill is. But as I previously stated, blue to purple will make this viable. Gray or green, you're going to have a rough time. It's still helpful, but you really need to get it to blue or purple to make it worth it. You can beat runs with even just blue if you're careful, but purple will make things easy. The next attack you can do that uses the chisel is the second hit, R1, in a combo. So R1, R1 does a stab with the chisel. It has decent range for what it is, and it gives you a little bit more health back than your first hit. Uh, but it still does not do fantastic damage. Let's see if I can hit something with it real quick. So if I do this, and then second hit, see how I got a little bit of a chunk back that time? Still not fantastic damage. Ignore me stepping in the bear trap. So, the third way to get it back, and the best, is R1, R2, or R2, R2. Depending. Um... The second hit R2 attack is a big swipe with the chisel that doesn't have great range, but does fantastic damage for what it is, because it is a heavy attack, and therefore it restores a massive chunk of health. Just watch. Look at how much HP that I recovered from hitting that basic enemy 
with this attack. This is the best way to beat the DLC. This ability right here. And you can even hit dying enemies while they're still falling down or dying bosses to restore some health while they're going down. If you utilize this attack, just R1, R2, this can carry you through the DLC, if I'm being honest. When I discovered this, I quickly recognized that, as far to my knowledge so far, this is probably the cheesiest way to win, because the healing on this ability is ridiculous. The only downside is you gotta find it, right? It is random, but the hammer and chisel is already a good weapon to do runs with, so if you're using this weapon, it's just a massive benefit. We'll move on to the third one that I don't think is as good as this one, but it is still very good. And so the third instinct that we're going to talk about is for the Hallowed Sword, and this is Leeching Spike. This makes 30% of the damage dealt by your weapon abilities heal you. So this is your supers. Clearly, this is not as good as just every regular attack with the chisel, or... Yes, the, the chisel attack specifically, excuse me, uh, healing you. But this does give you a very large chunk of HP. This goes well with characters like Solomon, who can hold more bars of, um, of uh, meter. And this obviously can be fueled by items. Um... do it here. See? Decent chunk. The reason why I didn't get more health from that, I also believe, is because the enemy didn't have enough health, because Mechanical Spike does a ton of damage. I know in boss fights, I can heal quite a bit of HP off of this move. The problem is it costing two bars. If you can get two bars consistently, great. But certain bosses, like the final boss of this DLC, make it pretty hard to gain instinct with the way they fight. So if you're using the Hallowed Sword and you're using this skill, the best way to get it is using abilities, uh, or I'm sorry, not abilities, items, like the Golden Bell or like Moonshine, Superior or Inferior. Inferior Moonshine will give you one bar, but it also minuses a little bit of health. So the amount you're getting back, considering you need to use two of them, is not great. Use that if you already have like one bar and you need to top off. Superior Moonshine will not cost any health and will give you three, immediately allowing you to use the skill. And, of course, if you equip and use a Golden Bell, which I have a ton of, as you can see, it gives you way more resolve gain, making it way easier. You can also, of course, find other instincts that increase resolve gain or slow the decay of your resolve, like we talked about earlier. And... Combining these with this ability does make it a viable healing tool, and I have completed runs because of being able to heal with it. But it is still dependent on a resource. Of course, if you're also out of resolve, parrying an enemy will give you a resolve bar. So you can also use a parry to gain a bar of resolve as well. Um, so these are the three perks that I know of that can give you more HP. I don't recall seeing any other instincts that give you HP besides, oh no, I'm actually, I am incorrect. There is an instinct I believe that can give you some health back for Harden, no, my bad, that's, that's Resolve. There is a Harden instinct that gives you back Resolve for being hit while hardened, which uh, could again be good for this build but as far as I'm, I recall, that's everything that can heal you as far as um, these, like, actively in combat through perks. Last Chance has some that can heal you uh, upon, you know, a very low percentage chance upon dying. Um, but I wouldn't rely on those, and those don't really count as healing. That's more you died and then got lucky. And... Of course, there are parry ones that I mentioned or repost ones that I mentioned that give you more health if you're using the healing parry, but we already went over. That's basically the same as just using the parry to heal. You just get more out of it. So that being said, 
the reason why I wanted to show you regeneration and these other two perks is because I truly believe these are the best way if you're just looking to beat the DLC easily. They already exist on the best weapons, as far as the weapon one goes, two of the best weapons, not the Axatana. But they exist on some of the best weapons, and they it the one thing about this DLC that most people are having trouble with is having to go through so many zones and bosses without getting hit too many times. So this is one of the ways that you can help alleviate that. I'm going to show you another thing you can do. And we're going to talk about that right now because we're going to go back way back when. And we're going to go back to talking about temples. All right, all right. I know you're probably thinking anxiety. You've told us all of this information. You know, you've went over all these perks. You said you were going to show us how to consistently make it to the first temple so we can start getting money to upgrade these perks. The whole reason I wanted to show off the healing instincts first, um, even though it's a little bit out of order, because, you know, you need these with money to make them worth it, is just to show people that there are ways of making this easier. Because playing this mode discourages a lot of people. Don't think you need to play perfectly and that you can never heal. There are ways out of it, but you will need to, for lack of a better expression, get good to a certain extent. You will need to make a limited number of mistakes across the course of a run. However, there are ways we can limit that. For one, you don't even have to fight most of the enemies that you see once you did my first step, which is getting Haros's skin and completing a weapon to the point where it at least has like a blue or purple perk as the starting perk. Um, you don't need to, to kill every enemy or even tackle every pillar that you see if the pillar, you know, maybe has too many enemies around it. It's one of the ones where you need to clear them. I'm going to do a quick run to show you how to just run around the map and try to get into the first temple with our newly acquired Haro skin that gives us the 10,000. And then I'm gonna show you how to do the first temple and the first boss fight and show you how easy it can be. Uh, and this will get you started on your way to completing more runs because you'll be able to afford the upgrades in the runic gate that I've been talking about this whole time and you'll start getting more consistent good perks. Lastly, we'll talk about some of the broken things in the game and some of the other instincts that I think you should be looking out for in runs and that'll be it. So, I'm going to start this up. Let's uh let's try a run. All right. We've uh we've loaded into a new run. We're just going to try to as quickly as possible search pillars and look for a way into the Temple of Ash. We have 10,000 tar from the skin that we're wearing. And we're not only trying to get to the Temple of Ash to spend this tar. That's obviously a reason that we got this skin and it will help us, but it's also for the incredible amount of items that are inside of the temple because the first temple is the smallest one and it is the easiest one it also has the highest density of items funny enough it is just overall the best one to do first oh my stamina Is the other enemy that's connected to this? It's you. All right. Remember to be picking up items like these that are easily accessible because these items make or break runs. They can really, really help you, especially if you're getting glimpses. Because, again, all your objective is right now is to collect things. You're not looking to, you know, win entire runs you're during the collection phase. It's okay to die as long as you are gathering supplies. I have no idea when we'll find a, uh, a pillar that has the 
token in it. It's always random. Sometimes you get lucky and get it right away. Sometimes it takes you quite a bit of searching. It's okay to spend some tar on these yellow pillars, especially if you've purchased discounts that lets you pay less for them. But you should try to avoid buying a ton of them. And we got pretty lucky. Token of Ash within just a little while. I'm going to grab this item real quick first. And it was actually another instinct. So... When you get the token, it's going to give you a consumable in your inventory called the Temporal Stone. If you use this item, it'll teleport you straight to the temple. You could, of course, walk around and get more stuff first, but, I mean, for, you know, efficiency, you should probably use it as soon as you get it and then move on, try to get as many runs as possible in. I would say you're probably going to have to do two to three hours of gathering before you can make any real attempt at beating the run. You might be more godly than me, and you might be able to do it earlier, but I'm gonna go ahead and buy this one. I'm willing to spend a little bit more tar. And there are items everywhere in this temple. So just try to keep an eye on what I'm collecting as we go. Because there are items all over the place. We do have to search all the pillars in the temple too in order to try to find the key to the boss fight. Because you do need to find a token for the boss as well. But just look how many items that we get during this temple. Because this is the best way, the quickest way. Running this skin, trying to beat the boss, and then spending all the tar. And along the way to getting to the boss, grabbing... Oh no. All of these items that are around here. You don't have to fight anything in here, really. Like, we could fight this one, because it's a red pillar, but I'm going to choose to skip it, because it might take a little bit too long. There's three items right there. Get my stamina back a little bit. There's three items in this right here, the sarcophagus. And we don't have to fight any of this. They're not too hard to run by. Just be careful of the, the guys that throw fireballs. There's three more in this. There's a tar guy right behind me, so I need to be careful. And there's two more right here. I'm actually going to kill these ones. Did my super come out? There we go. Because they're really easy to kill, so basically free. We're just going to open this up, get three more items. You don't have to open these either because they take a while to open. You get ambushed after opening them. There's always enemies that spawn around you, so it can be a little bit risky. But, I mean, more items, you know, we're just trying to collect things. Um, so, come in here, there's another item there. All of these items that I'm picking up, the contents of them are random, but they're always there. You can always get these. This chest is a little bit risky to pick up because of the enemies around you, but you have an opportunity. And I'm gonna do something a little bit risky and come in here, because there's more items here. This is the other hallway we didn't go down before. If you get set on fire, you can't take fire damage while dodging or while hardened, so you can kind of wait out the fire damage by doing a combination of those two things. Another item here. This is Vim, one of the mini bosses. We don't have to fight him though. We can just take his items. There's an item right there beside the pillar. There's an item here. And then we can just run away from him. Oops, tried to use Super. I've been having a problem with my PS5 controller using Super. I can't believe he came out of his arena all the way over here. I didn't know he follows you this far. We're gonna have to back up more. I've never seen him follow the other. Do do do. This enemy dropped a glimpse. Another pillar up here, and we finally got it. We finally got the the key. He's still following me. That's crazy. I'm probably gonna get hit here because I can't get around them. There we go. Um. 
and I'm sure I've missed some items in here as well that I think are laying around on the floor. But you've you've seen it didn't take me too too long to get here. Um, and we picked up just a ton of items along the way, and all of those, all that tar, all those glimpses you can spend back when you're in the hub, uh, to get permanent upgrades. Right in here, we're gonna ignore that pillar for now. Another pillar down here. And then we'll try to beat Imrod really quick. He's not too tough, he's the easiest boss in the game. So, we're just gonna beat him real quick. You should be very good at fighting Imrod after a very short amount of time. He is incredibly easy. And once we beat the boss, I'll be seeing you again, and we're going to uh, we're going to visit the Runic Gate and spend the currency that we have. Very unfortunate mistake I made there. I ended up hitting the wrong button by accident and uh, getting myself killed. But regardless of that, he's a very easy boss. Um, even easier if you have more powers. And we pick up his item, Imrod's token. That's not really important. We can go ahead and let the game transfer over. We're going to return to where we just came from in the boss room. So you can do this in about 10 minutes, on average, I would say. Um, I did it even quicker using the Axatana, and I will show off why the Axatana is so broken um, in the final section of this video after this. But for now, we got our first Sacred Gland. Now what's important is that we can now visit the Runic Gate right here. And we 
we've kept all of that tar. See the 10k from this skin? We kept it. So now we can spend that. Doesn't seem like much, but you can dish out on these upgrades. And again, it might not have seemed like I spent much there, but you have to also consider that I'm also gathering glimpses. and consumable tar at the same time. So we can do things like this. And we can do things. I'm Normally I would not recommend spending your consumable tar until you've returned back to the hub, um, until you have 100% you know, keep tar, the uh, retain tar, excuse me. But, I mean, as you can see here, I got quite a few upgrades in that one run. And I did have some items on me from before, a, a few, but most of the items that you saw in my inventory right there were picked up during this run. Just a couple runs. It didn't take me too, too long. Like I said, you're probably going to have to do two to three hours of this in order to up adequately equip yourself for actually completing runs. You can still continue. You can continue from here. You go over here, offer the gland, and then go to the next dungeon. I'd recommend uh, to uh, the Crypt of Martyrs first because it's easier overall than the Seed of Infinity. Uh, I, I do ash then infinity then martyrs in my most recent runs but that's because sometimes i die in infinity and i don't like to do that last because then i had to go through all of the second area and lose out a run because of something stupid that happened to the third but um that being aside that doesn't matter to you right now you could continue continue your run keep going keep trying to get farther but if you're not feeling confident you just you want to gather up your items and prepare better. I recommend just dying, like let yourself die, don't worry about it. Restart the run, do it again. Pick the same Haro skin, do it again. This, if you want to be maxed out, to be the most prepared, the fastest, is the fastest way to do it. Because you're going to get the most items from running that area and you're getting a decent amount of tar from just the skin itself without even having to do anything since it starts you with 10k this in my experience is the fastest way this is how i got all of my runes maxed out and then i started to was getting purple perks that are really good and ended up finishing the dlc really early before anyone else that i know um so this is what I would recommend. We're going to move on. I'm going to talk about a few things about weapons that are very, very good, such as the Axatana being broken, and some other perks that you want to look out for, things that you want to pick, um, and then we'll finish off the video. Okay, so to close out, uh, there's a couple more things to talk about. The first is actually I forgot to talk about the loots and why you would buy them. Let's start with the simple loot. So the loots actually give you stat bonuses and they do have extra functions, but primarily it's stat bonuses. The simple loot uh, will actually slowly refill your health while playing it. This can't be used in boss fights, but if you know, you're know you new, you're just starting, I suppose you could buy this and use it as a heal. The problem with using any of the loots for their their playing purposes is that, as you can read, the loot breaks after using it three times. This is only in runs, by the way. You can use it as many times as you want out here in the hub. That's how you max out the familiarity on it. But during runs, you can't use it in boss fights to heal because the healing is far too slow and the loot animation is far too long. Um, and it only heals you three times and it breaks. And the loot costs 25000 every time you want to buy it again. Um, so I'm not entirely sure this is worth it. Um, but 
if you're carrying the loot with you, it does give you 30 to your maximum HP, which is a pretty decent chunk. So if you want to save 25k of your tar, you can buy this. I would only recommend, though, buying these loots after you at least have the improved last chance max out and have like 10% in each of these chances. I would say that way you can get some good perks. Uh, at, at least the last chance if you're if you're gonna buy the loots before perks, but they do help. They're just expensive. The impervious loot is a little bit better. If you play it, uh, you are prevented from getting staggered for two minutes. Uh, th this one is actually kind of neat because you can do some interesting things with this if you're not worried about your health to speedrun bosses. But again, it breaking after three uses, this one is 50,000. So while you can do some interesting things with it to do like boss fights quicker because you can't be staggered out of things, um, I don't really know that it's worth it in general if you're trying to save up your, your tar to waste 50k on something like this. However, it does give you 30 stamina if it's in your inventory, which helps a lot with running around like I was with Haros. If you buy this loot, you'll be able to run around more. But again, if you have 50k to waste, by the time I had 50k to waste, you probably don't need to do my Haro strat anymore. So I wouldn't worry too much about this. And then finally, the real expensive one, 75,000 for the clockwork loot. And this one has an incredibly powerful ability but it's also incredibly expensive. It actually gives you Endless Unborn if you play it, which means, again, it's, it'd be nearly impossible to get this in the middle of a boss fight, but if you lose your revive, this can give you back your revive by playing it. However, it breaks immediately after one use. And so having to spend 75k, ugh, that's, that's rough, especially since... It being in your inventory, this is easily the best one. It gives you 10 to health and stamina, which is a decent boost. Not as much as the other two separately, but it gives it to both. And it gives you an extra resolve bar. Your inventory at almost all times is, is what I run with. Um, but all the loots have very uh, useful stat boosts on them. Um, so I just wanted to mention that for anyone that's curious about how those loots work. Uh, finally... We're going to talk a bit about the Axitana. <laughs> so this thing is broken, um, to put it nicely. Uh, Mortal Shell, I'm not really sure how to explain it other than it's just how the game works. Big damage is not what staggers enemies. And weapons don't seem to have poise values like I would expect, like in other Souls games. To put it in layman's terms, enemies get staggered in this game, the more you hit them, not the weight of the attack, nor necessarily the damage of the attack. So while you can stagger things with the Martyr's Blade and its big, heavy-hitting R2, which sends enemies flying, you can also, if you do an R1 with the Martyr's Blade, they won't stagger on a single R1 sometimes, even though that R1 takes forever to come out. Whereas one to two hits of this katana, like this, because it hits twice on the first R1, the first light attack, will automatically stagger some enemies. And because it attacks so fast, I find it the most consistent for staggering bosses as well. Even though it doesn't do as much damage per hit, the stagger potential is through the roof. On top of this, the running attack of this weapon is ridiculously broken. Um, I'm going to put in some footage at the end of the video of things that this weapon can do. And I, I made another video called The Axitana is Spicy, and I included some funny clips of broken things I found, and I will be including footage of that at the end of the video so that you can see what I'm talking about. But the running attack of this weapon, you can do running attacks in this game by simply hitting circle plus R2. You don't have to actually be running to do the running attacks. Um, you just have to hold circle for like half a second, then press R2, and it will work. Um... If you just spam this running attack, it does amazing damage, and it also hits... It, it Because it hits twice, it staggers really, really amazing damage. So this thing can just... 
and just shred through health bars. This is one of the main reasons why this thing is godlike. On top of it already having the incredible fast attack speed, it does pretty low damage in katana form, but the attack speed makes up for it. And this running attack, being as broken as it is. Also, it has a weapon switch. L1R1 switches it to axe mode. While in axe mode, it does encumber your movement. As you see, it takes me longer to dodge than if I'm in katana. This is the difference between light and heavy weapons. Um, but it it does hit decently hard. It's not nearly you know as much as the Martyr's Blade or the Smoldering Mace, as far as heavies go. But it comes with one of the most broken supers in the game which I will be including footage for. The L2R2 super for this axe has you throwing yourself into the air and coming down on top of enemies. But it is currently buggy, and you can land on top of enemies and not be able to... It's like your character is trying to fall to the ground because you're doing like an overhead cleave, right? You're jumping in the air, coming down on the enemy, and you're supposed to land on the ground at the end of the move. But your hurt, your hurt box will actually get stuck on top of them and the axe's hitbox does not end until you touch the ground. So, again, I'm going to include footage so you can visualize it. But essentially, this move can hit the enemy while coming down repeatedly over and over and over again. Because it, you can't touch the ground, and it just shreds through a health bar in like 30 seconds. You can instant kill bosses with this super if you get it to work right. However, this is kind of an exploit. This is clearly not intentional. And I also can't recommend doing it because it's buggy. If you're serious about winning runs, I would be very super because um, sometimes when you do it, you soft lock the game. You can kill enemies so fast that animations don't play, like Crucix. When you kill Crucix, phase one, his little brother that's attached to him is supposed to die and there's a cutscene that plays. However, if you kill him using this super, there is the possibility that cutscene won't play, and so the game will just softlock. Your run isn't dead, because you can exit to main menu, and it will restart your progress before the boss fight. But whatever resources or whatever health you've lost in the boss fight will be lost, and you'll have to redo the boss fight from scratch. So you don't get anywhere by doing it. It's funny, it's cool, but it also has the possibility of softlocking your game. So I can't really recommend killing things with it until it's fixed, if the devs fix it. Uh, but still, the running attack alone is good reason to pick this weapon, and also the animation to change between the axe and dual katana forms uh, has iframes all the way through it. You can use this to dodge attacks, and there is only a small window where you can't dodge or attack or anything that you can be hit in, so you can straight up use this to dodge a number of attacks. It costs no stamina, and you can use it while out of stamina and while your harden is on cooldown to avoid attacks by bosses and let your stamina it, your stamina will come back during the animation of the move. I can show you. Um, if I use my stamina and then use this, my stamina actually does start coming back during it. Uh, better if you time it, see? So that I was able to recharge my stamina while recovering from the animation, and that's just super useful. On top of that, you can cancel basically any anim excuse me any animation into it. So like, you can even cancel the running attack. So if you decide you've overcommitted to something, you can just cancel that attack directly into it. It lets you dodge anything with zero commitment needed, and there's very little risk that you'll be hit in the small window where you can't do anything after the transformation. There is a risk but it is a small risk. This is incredibly powerful, and I'm not sure why the devs gave this weapon this ability. Uh, it might be removed in the future, I'm not sure, if they decide to balance it. It makes this weapon, like, the best weapon in the game, in my opinion. Um, but I, the reason why I said the, um, not sickle, but the hammer and chisel are still a better weapon is the healing perk that you can find while using them. They also have a better L1R1 super, the one that where he sprays nails everywhere. That is very good for clearing out. It does incredible boss damage, even though you wouldn't think it would. It also does a fantastic job of clearing out groups of enemies, so it's very good for clearing like levels and zones. Um, so I think, honestly, this weapon is still better for 
uh, general runs. But that's just an overview of some of the weapon things that make these two weapons good. The Hollow Sword is simple. It's just attack speed and damage. It has good attack speed, good damage. One of the best running attacks in the game, and it has one of the best supers in the game. The Mechanical Spike does fantastic damage, knocks the enemy down pretty much guaranteed when you do it, um, no matter what. This is just a solid weapon. A lot of speedrunners use this weapon. Um, so yeah, that's just some extra weapon stuff. Um, other things to think about. Other things to think about. Let's talk about instincts one more time. So what instincts should I be looking for during my runs? What should I pick? Well, first of all, anything Ballista Zooka related, you probably don't got to worry about too much. The best perks for Ballista Zooka, I would say, are exploding rounds, because you can use them to clear out hordes of enemies. Damage, because you can use it again to clear out big enemies from afar. But most importantly, early game, when you're starting off like you guys will be, the most important instinct for the Ballista Zooka is uh, ammo drop. There is one that makes it drop more ammunition. And because you'll start out with very few bolts, this will help you get more bolts off of enemies and such uh, to start building up a stock. Once you have a stock of ammunition for the Ballista Zooka, damage or exploding rounds. Exploding rounds can let you catch multiple enemies with one bolt to kind of clear out larger groups you might be having trouble with. Maybe there's a tower that you have to clear enemies off of and you want to use it. Or you can up its damage to clear high-value targets, like the clerics in the Seed of Infinity. With the ones of the big maces, they have a ton of health. But overall, uh, I don't use the Ballista Zooka too, too much. And so it's not important. Now, does that mean that I shouldn't pick any, you know, if I get a tower that gives me a choice between the Ballista Zooka and a stat increase? like flame resist should i pick the flame resist honestly no because you still want to fill out these charts that way the game can make it so that you can if you find a tower later on there's a better chance that you could get something else out of the tower besides the ballista zooka perk uh so i but overall i wouldn't like focus on this too much another one to not focus on is kick the kick is not incredibly useful i would say making the kick uh make enemies vulnerable to repost sometimes is a good perk for this slot um i wouldn't really worry about too much i almost never use kick besides to stun lock some mini bosses or regular enemies and none of the perks that you get for kick will really matter too much Stone Stomp is another one that's pretty much useless. Uh, you almost never use this, and none of the perks are necessary for it. So you can pretty much pick anything. Uh, I don't really have a preference. Dodge. Dodge is important. I would say the two that you want is, depending on who you're playing, either dodge speed increase while locked on or unlocked on, depending on if you fight more locked on or unlocked. It depends. Um, and... I would say explosive dodge. So there's one that makes it, there's one that is literally called explosive dodge. It makes an explosion, like a yellow explosion, appear below your feet whenever you dodge. Now, again, this is dodge, not roll. Okay, they're two different things. The dodge is the, the step dash or your back step. Um, the explosive dodge at purple rarity can do like 25 damage, and you can do it whenever you just dodge an enemy's attack, so it's just free damage whenever you're close to your opponent. And you can even use it to cheese some bosses by simply walking, like, you know, slowly walking backwards while locked on, and whenever they get in range, doing a back step and seeing if the explosion hits them. Again, you can do a lot of things in this game that take you ages to win, but can make you win without ever getting hit. <laughs> Um, because this game has very strong mechanics. So I'd say explosive dodge is what you want. Don't take freeze dodge if possible. The one that freezes enemies solid. It is weird. Sometimes it doesn't actually freeze the enemies. Um, they break, break out of it instantly. And sometimes if you hit them while they're frozen, the freeze doesn't like stun them or anything. So while it does freeze them in place, once you hit them, they recover instantly. And sometimes they recover so fast, they can hit you during your recovery period as you're hitting them without any ability to dodge. The freeze is very jank, and so I can't recommend you ever take it. It'll probably hurt you more than it will help you. So pick anything else. Um, explosive dodge is optimal. And dodge either stamina cost reduction while locked on 
or unlocked. Or uh, I w- usually for dodge, I go for locked on because I dodge more while I'm locked on uh, rather than rolling. So I would say those are the perks that you want to look for for dodge. Harden, you definitely want either super harden, harden cooldown, or when you get hit, harden gives you resolve. The third one is self-explanatory. We already kind of talked about it. Um, Being able to be hit while hardened and giving you back some resolve is very useful, but it isn't the most useful because you still have to, it only gives you some back. You still have to be hitting enemies to make sure that resolve bar is going up. But resolve is very good, so I mean, that is obviously useful. Uh, Super harden, let's explain that. There is a perk that gives you a small chance that every time you harden, your next harden will be called a super harden. And uh, basically what it means is um, your harden will remain active, but you can move. It will remain active for like five seconds, but you can move around and hit things. This just means that you can hit bosses without them being able to hit you. You can just go ham on them. Uh, and basically do like a damage phase. You can use this to cheese enemies by just continuously hitting Harden every now and again whenever it recharges, and seeing if you can get Super Harden to proc, and then when it does proc, going in and hitting the enemy. So this is an incredibly powerful skill. Uh, And the final one, Harden cooldown, self-explanatory. The more you can Harden, the better. It is basically your blocking mechanic in this game, it saves you from being hit when you make a mistake. It allows you to uh, to cheese enemies because you can like swing and then harden, and then the AI are dumb, so they'll walk up and hit you, and your swing will go through frame one and it will hit them. Um, so it's an easy way to cheese out like the final bosses of the game and stuff. You basically have to play like hardened footsies with them. Uh, so yeah, those are the instincts I would go for under this category. As for repost, I I never really worry about the repost perks too much. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, Basically anything, I'm just going to say. I I don't really ever use... I use parry, but I only use parry to heal. So I only do perks that increase my healing off of parry. Uh, So the repost perks, I never really think about too much. Same with the parry perks. I wouldn't... This is tuned to your personal playstyle. Neither of these is going to, like, carry you through a run, in my opinion. Um... Character instincts are, it depends on who you're playing, because they're all good. The, this category has health increase, has regeneration, which we already talked about as one of the ones you'd want to pick. It has stamina increase, it has sprint cost decrease, it has um, resolve gain uh, and resolve lost over time. It has basically all the strongest general perks, and all of them are good. It depends on your playstyle. I'd say the best ones are more resolve gained, because resolve is very good in this game, and more um, the health regeneration perk, where you slowly regen health, because even though it doesn't seem like much, it helps you in the long run. Roll. So Roll has some very dirty stuff. At the end of the video, I'll be including a a footage that I made in another video, where, and I also included it in my ending video for the Virtuous Cycle, I found a build where you can roll into things and kill them instantly. (laughs) So there is a perk called Dagger Roll, and it makes your character fire out out, a ring of daggers from around you whenever you roll. There's a chance for it to occur. And they do damage, and the chance is increased by how high rarity the perk is. Dagger roll is is easier. There's another one that can do it, but we'll talk about that after. Dag- if you roll directly into an enemy at the right angle while they're doing attacks, can make all of the daggers spawn inside of the enemy, and so all of them hit them, and it can do upwards of seven to 800 damage and just instant kill bosses. It's a little bit finicky, but it's very low risk, high reward, because you're rolling, and you're invincible while rolling, so it's very, very hard to fuck up and get hit while trying this maneuver, and it is incredibly rewarding. So absolutely take dagger roll, even if you're not using it to kill bosses, because you need it at at least purple to kill bosses, if not legendary. Um, Even if you're not using it to kill bosses, it is a good roll perk, because every now and again you'll roll and just fire some daggers and they'll hit enemies. Lava roll is another good choice, because it makes you fire lava balls out of yourself. However, these shoot at an upward angle and then come down, whereas the daggers just shoot directly, like, straight out in eight directions. 
Uh, so I find it harder to hit with the lava roll, but it is basically the same function. You can roll into things and make the lava balls spawn inside of the enemy and then merc them. These two are very strong, in my opinion, if you can get them to purple. Purple or legendary of lava roll or dagger roll are OP. <laughs> um, and they go very well when combined with explosive dodge, like we talked about earlier. So, <clears throat> with that out of the way, with that being said... Um, I would say non-locked-on roll distance or roll speed are also good perks because it's easy to you can use that to roll around in the open world or in boss fights to get away from things. Just remember to like unlock on. Uh, you can also do it while locked on, but I find the unlocked on one for me to be better. But those are the perks you're particularly looking for with roll. Uh, last chance, <sighs> pretty much any of them. There is one that, if you get it to very high rarities, is useful, which is a, a saving throw or something like that. There is one that makes it so you have a, a chance to not lose your shell and instead c spend a bar of resolve when you die. So if you have a bar of super, like the resolve meter, and you die, I think at purple rarity or at legendary, I forget it's a 50% chance at that rarity. If you can get it at that high of a rarity, it is useful. Below that, it's really not. And most of these perks are only okay. Again, I'd say this one, again, is not as important unless you're getting that really high rarity saving throw one. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Weapon ones are particular to each weapon. I'm not going to go into all of those. Um, I'm just going to say the ones that I mentioned earlier in the video that are healing based are your best odds for those. Otherwise, most of the time, my weapon instincts didn't even help me that much, if I'm being honest. Uh, like, besides the healing ones, it's just basically do more damage. Look for things that make you do more damage or heal yourself. I know that sounds stereotypical, but that is the best way to beat the mode. Um, and combat instincts, again, it's... Uh, it's depending on your weapon. Usually I'd say heavy attacks do more damage or cost less stamina is better because running attacks are very good and they count as uh, heavy attacks. Also momentum attacks, which are directly tied to running attacks. Um, things like that. I'd say you use heavies a lot in this game for doing damage, so heavy attacks or running attack based perks. You just want to increase your damage. Um, I know. You know, it's not as interesting of a guide as you might think. <laughs> but sometimes the simplest things are the most effective. Uh, so that is what I would choose for my perks. It's going to depend a little bit on each player. It's going to depend on RNG. You're not always going to get the good stuff. I would say, don't worry about my advice too much. Just use my advice, or my advice on these perks too much. Use my advice from the beginning of the video to get yourself specced out with these chants of uncommon, rare, epic tier increase and legendary tier. And then when you start getting consistent purples and consistent legendaries um, every single run, make your own choice on what you want. The only thing I would keep in mind from what I said was uh, definitely the healing perks if you want to cheese things they do help you cheese things. Because Mortal Shell is the type of game that you can play very, very slowly. If you want to just sit in the boss room, most bosses don't really chase after you too bad, and you can just roll away from them, because your roll goes a very far different distance, excuse me, and has a lot of iframes. Um, so if you really do have the patience to just sit there for like 10 minutes and hit a boss once while hardened and then back off and wait the the eight seconds for hardened to come back you can do that it is very easy to cheese this game's combat with how it's designed it all depends on if one you're okay with that and b you have patience for me i don't really like doing that so i i end up just bum rushing things most of the time and that's why i lose some runs but if you are the type of person that just wants to win you can pick those healing perks you can play lame and just wait for your health to come back or get a hit in at a time etc uh the easiest way to win like i said is gonna be the chisel heal on the hammer and chisel that thing is at blue to purple rarity that hammer and chisel absolutely destroys things and of course you can harden while doing it so you can like trade with a boss on the his the chisel attack to gain back health 
Um, so, yeah, I would say th those are what you want to do. I'm going to put some extra video clips of the Axitana and the, um, the roll build that I did at the end of this video. Just really short snippets so you can see what I was talking about. And the rest is going to be up to you. I'm sorry that the, the guide wasn't more well edited. I wanted to make this a bigger project, but I want to get it out by tomorrow to try to help people that are maybe just getting started with the DLC. And I don't have a lot of free time on my hands. Life is kind of really hectic for me right now. So this is going to have to do for now. If anybody has any questions, if anybody needs any help with a particular boss, a particular weapon, shell, etc., play style even, you can simply leave a comment and I try to get back to comments as soon as I can. I will help you. Um, we, uh, you know, through text, I will. If I have to, I'll make a dedicated short video to it if somebody needs help. Even if it's just one person, I'll try to help the best that I can. Uh, I hope that everyone ants and sticks with it because while you will die a lot in the beginning and you will need to spend like two to three hours to start getting going, the DLC is very fun. And it's very addictive. I would say just give it some time. Just don't be mad at your losses because you're supposed to lose. It's a roguelike. Um, you're supposed to die. You're supposed to fail. You're not supposed to beat it your first time. You're not even supposed to beat it until you have all your upgrades. Well, for most people anyway. You absolutely can. I beat it before I got all my upgrades for the first time. Um, but... You know, don't sweat it if you're still failing before you get everything. And even after you get everything, it can take a bit of practice getting used to the bosses, the enemies, excuse me, um, the maps, etc. So just stick with it, and it will be rewarding to you, trust me. Um, I'm going to head off to the clips now. Remember, comment if you need any help with anything. I'll see you guys in the next one.